It's a brand new technology to the market. Um, it's a proprietary technology from Hitachi, um, and it's only available from Hitachi. So the benefits are only available from Hitachi. In a VMware environment, it has um, a profound impact, um, as well as in an OLTP, in a, in a highly random I.O. environment, it has a very profound impact. So we're looking at the drivers from storage. Now, Hitachi Data Systems is part of a larger company, Hitachi Limited. We looked at the drivers within storage and, and the storage infrastructure. We realized there was a gap between today's traditional SaaS-based technologies and the SSD technologies that were available today. And, and the fact that the workloads that were being generated by applications were completely different from the technology profile that we're, the storage arrays were providing. So we noticed there's a huge gap there. We looked at um, everything from the, the web 2.0, the large scale um, technologies, and um, on-demand streaming, so uh, multimedia, entertainment, large sequential streams of data, big data management, metadata management, and multi-tenancy, cloud, and also data warehousing and data mining to extract that data meaning, which is going to be the foundations of the next um, infrastructure platform. So we noticed there's an increased randomness, especially in the VMware environment. We're noticing that um, up to 99% of the IOs into the VMware infrastructure are random. Now, what does that mean? It means that your storage infrastructure cannot cache those, so flash cache and uh, technologies like that basically can help you. We need to just find a new approach and find a new technology to address those requirements. We notice there's an increase in throughput as well. So from a throughput perspective, we notice there, just, there isn't the, the throughput and from the storage infrastructure and from the technology infrastructure, and we've seen up to you know, 10 or, or so um, flash startups um, that, that we're tracking with, with interest to see exactly where the, where the leaders from a technology perspective. We, uh, we noticed the requirement as well for the decreased latency. So latency is a killer. The distance, the time it takes between asking for something to do something and it being responded back. So VMware, VDI, all of these things, you'll notice that response time is a very important part of that. So server virtualization is exactly what we're talking about. There's a bit of marketing um, information here around um, where we are today. The problems we've had for the last three or four years have remained. Nothing's new from a technology perspective. What, uh, what is new from a technology perspective, from my perspective, is the impact of the financial aspect. And the financial aspect on every, everyone's architecture, everyone's design, everyone's VMware infrastructure. There's obviously an inability to, uh, to plan and to, from a scalability perspective, to scale linearly. And that's something which has been much touted, but it's very difficult to actually achieve without the right technology and without the right um, storage technology. So what did this actually do to meet these high I.O. requirements? Well, we went back to the drawing board. We took the VSP, which is already with a, a, you know, an enterprise class or a, a controller. And by enterprise class, I mean the ability to scale to meet I.O. requirements without replacing, adding another tray of disks or an, another um, rack of disks or CPUs or, or memory. The ability to scale up in place, that's the important part um, between the enterprise technology and having an availability profile which is 100% guaranteed. So we have a 100% data availability guarantee on the VSP platform. Now, what we've done is we've re-engineered the microcode. So we've taken an already efficient technology platform, the Hitachi um, VSP. We've uh, re-engineered the microcode and we've created some new express host IO paths. Now, those host IO paths are loved by ESX and they're loved by OLTB, random IO transactions, so VDI, um, etc. There's a for anyone who has a VSP, who's lucky enough to have a VSP, there's a 120-day free trial available if you just talk to your sales reps um, to see whether that technology is actually going to... Because it's all about the workload and um, the randomness of the workload. On top of that, we added a flash controller. Now, we've taken proprietary technology from other Hitachi business units and we've created a flash controller. So this flash controller is high performance. It's, in, it's in, in, embedded into the disk drives themselves. And we have the ability to do um, zero block compression, and, and it's the same thing as the 94% rate reduction. What we're able to do is um, look at sequences of numbers and be able to reduce the number of writes to the media. So we're taking EMLC media, um, which is today's you know, standard cost perspective, and we're reducing the impact on the actual EMLC media. So we're using it less, but we're getting more out of it. 
So on top of that, we've taken the form factor of the drive themselves and we've pushed that form factor. So we've got, we're increasing the form factor of an SSD from what, 400 gigs to 1.6 terabytes. So this drive and the form factor will grow up larger than that. But the, the, the better operational cost per petabyte, we're basically pushing down the I.O. and the I.O. density to, to multiple times more than we have in, in the past. And certainly it's possible with, um, with a SaaS technology. So this is 40% lower bit cost. So the usable IOP and the usable capacity is, is um, 400 times, 400% more than today's technologies. So for those people who don't know what a VSP is, it's an enterprise controller. And it has the ability to scale to add more cache, more ports. And at the heart of that controller effectively is a large PCI Express switch. And, and the difference between the technology they have in modular architectures is they don't have that connectivity. They have to branch out, they connect up PCI buses. This has a switch inside so that every single asset inside there is one hop away. The memory is one hop away from the CPU, the CPU is one hop away from the controllers. So we can share cache, we can share memory, we can share components within that infrastructure. So everything's redundant as well. We'll give you that guarantee um, of I.O. You can use VMware's native round robin load balancing without any impact. There's no additional host profiles or server profiles you have to stand up just for this particular driver. There's no additional firmware needs to be added to the machines um, in your ESX infrastructure. So it's that adoptive approach. We're not, we're not telling people to be prescriptively, you must have this hardware driver on here, you must have a software driver. Use the native tools, keep it simple. And with all enterprise technology, you get advanced replication features. So we can do four data center replication so that when SRM steps up to the point where we can move between data centers, we have the technology to give ourselves um, IO availability at any of those four data centers. So what we've done, we'll basically increase the IOP capability of the hardware to over a million IOPS. And that's a million cache miss IOPS for those people who are into storage, um, like we are. That's not in the cache. That's IOPS that are on the back end sitting in the disks. And the response time, we're getting around three milliseconds for a million IOPS. Just a bit less IOPS, we're getting less than a millisecond response time. So the drives themselves, the drives are interesting because they are a new form factor. No one else has these. It's proprietary technology. And um, we're getting sustained performance. We've changed the error correction on these, um, these drives themselves. We're using 42-bit error correction on the drives. And, and what that means is we can push a lot more I.O. and track a lot more statistics on the drives. And that's a big difference from today's 16-bit. You know, they can only do wear leveling and within a limited time frame. We can do cache. We're getting to the point where we'll be able to do um, cache coherency and cache consistency across and because we have stored the data about the physical drive media. So in an ESX infrastructure, we have the ability to basically wear level across, across drives. And so that integration of the software and the, and the hardware and the technology will make a big difference because we're able to drive it faster. And I don't know if many people know this, but the irony of flash technologies is that you spend a lot of money on them, but they only go fast when they're empty. So you have to have high utilization of your enterprise Know, of flash technologies to get the best out of them. So the business guy says, you spent all this money on flash technologies and they're not performing very well. He said, yeah, well, I have to use them less or have them empty to get the best performance out of them. Now we've addressed that problem with this technology. We can take the capacity out to, instead of hitting a right cliff at 25%, these are, these are continue to work up to 70%. So the cost per IOP, we're getting out of these drives, is three to four times the density you're going to get out of a, of a, of a standard SLC drive and, or an MLC drive. So it's a big, big, big change. So the, the proof of the pudding is definitely in eating. This is a little bit about the technology, but the application of this technology is, is quite revolutionary within the data center. And, and also on top of that, as if you couldn't get any better, it's 40% lower uh, watts per terabyte, not than SaaS technology, but then EMLC SSD technology. So it's actually cheaper to run than today's the fastest and, fa and largest and flash drives you have available today. So there's a first, and cust first custom designed enterprise class solid state storage option for enterprise workloads. Yeah, sort of. Um, it's more a case of an application of technology. And it requires the three fundamental parts. It requires an enterprise grade storage controller. Um, 
it requires um, a form factor which is um, I can, I just control on the actual ASIC on the, the um, drive itself, and it requires a form factor of technology that can push that SLC and MLC technology out to the edge. So if someone comes up with a larger form factor of MLC technology, we can adopt that. We're just using standard MLC, but the way that we're writing to it is through Hitachi um, technology. And that's where the controller comes in. The controller is, is unique. This is custom ASIC designed, built by Hitachi. So we've taken a four-core processor, and we've got um, 32 paths off the back end to the physical flash drives, which means we've got twice as much throughput as MLC drives today. They only have 16 paths, so we've got twice as many paths. Um, the architecture as well, the quad-core processor, enables to do things like that inline compression and push the I.O. of the, the, the architecture out to the limits um, of the architecture. So previously, the SAS technologies were the limit. The drives are not the limit anymore. The storage controllers themselves actually hit the boundaries of those limits. So it's really important. You can't just take this technology and put it into a small modular box and expect it to perform well. All you'll do is point out that the modular box isn't big enough. You need to have the right architecture, the right microcode to understand how enterprise workloads work. And so that's exactly what we have with the VSP. This drive and this technology will be coming to the HusVM, which is a modular application of that. So we've uniquely, in the marketplace, we have a modular um, technology which has enterprise microcode on it. It's a big, that's another, another differentiator. So we have virtualization, we have um, three data set replication, we've got VAAI, we've got v, you know, VASA support. All of these things happen within that architecture. The, the flash module drives themselves, the 1.6 terabytes. So that's a 2U looking drive. It has its own enclosure. 2U looking drive that has um, basically 1.6 terabytes. There's enough address space to accommodate 16 terabytes, we've been told. But the drives themselves today will have 3.2 terabytes available by, the, by mid this year, and then 6.4 terabytes then after that. So that's a 6.4 terabytes usable. It's actually an 8 terabyte drive. And the way that SLC, MLC technologies work is they write down um, into spare, um, spare space, like a toner cartridge, they use up some spare space. The good thing is you don't have to worry about how much usable and raw capacity there is. All of this is, will be under Hitachi maintenance, so it all comes and gets replaced when it spares out. So we're looking at four flash enclosures behind a VSP, and that's 600 terabytes of flash. And if you use 3.2 terabyte drives, obviously you do the math on 6.4 terabyte drives, that's a petabyte of flash across two racks, basically of storage, and, and it's across 40 rack units. So 220 block rack units, and we'll be looking down the barrel of a petabyte of flash. So the capacities of the drives, as I said before, and more a bit of detail on how the packages are, are laid out. As you can see, the top left is a, is a picture of the drive itself. It's basically half populated. Um, but the interesting part is basically why have this technology only available on the, on the VSP or the enterprise platform. Now we're seeing the VMware workloads, an increase of multi-tenancy, requirement to push all that IO down to that, into that, uh, that storage controller. So discrete multi-tenanted virtualized workloads are increasingly complex. Um, and as you see, the white papers that we have available on this technology and on the, the, the unified platforms, they'll show you the, those workloads, the breakdown of those workloads, and they're definitely worth looking, looking for. We're seeing a lot of the tier one applications increase adoption of vCloud as well as we have multi-tenanted requirements from our customers, so you need a multi-tenanted infrastructure. And multi-tenanted from the ability from a resource control perspective, the ability to, to section off parts of an infrastructure to get as much out of that piece of infrastructure as possible. And then have control to reuse that infrastructure and move it around. So we're seeing, um, as I say, flash, there's no seek times. So from a response time perspective, it's very, it's very different. So from a vSphere perspective, um, there's a combination. There's a, there's an unspoken connection between the storage array and the file system. The problem we're having at the moment is we're using technologies to support the file system, because it is all about the file system. You had uh, Mike Labrick talking about the, um, the approach from a, 
to the to the vivo aspect. Um, obviously, those are things that we need to we need to accommodate whenever those file systems change. Whenever the the presentation underneath the VMware infrastructure changes, there'll be an even more stronger correlation towards the storage array and what the storage arrays are capable of and what the storage technology is capable of. So that correlation is very, very important. From our infrastructure perspective, obviously, you choose your hypervisor. And you choose whatever licenses you want, you choose your file system. If you want to go VMFS and go block, go that way. If you want to go NFS, go NFS. But use the right technology for NFS. You know, use something that can do primary DGP of its I.O. So all you have to do is put an HNAS, Hitachi NAS platform or an appropriate NAS platform in front of your technology platform and you can uh, leverage the benefits of, of that file system. From a server perspective, we, have, we've, uh, we, we obviously recommend to look at Cisco and look at uh, Hitachi servers. From a, from a storage perspective, obviously we, we ask you to look at Hitachi storage first, um, but obviously look at the adoption of your existing technologies. You can virtualize those technologies today. So if you had a made a regret cost, regret investment in something, or people, other people have spent spent money and you're not quite sure how to get off that platform, you don't have to worry about that. You can you can um, you can storage the emotion onto uh, any new technology platform. That's the idea, right? Or into the cloud. At the end of the day, storage virtualization can help you leverage or re-leverage those assets and monetize your existing assets, and that's a big difference. So from a file system perspective, um, there's a, to keep it simple, we basically tell people, if you want to go block, think about Flash. Think about the response time. If you want to go file, think about SAS. Okay? So there's a direct correlation between choosing the file system that matters and the disk technology. Now we can accelerate the NFS technology as well with Flash, putting the metadata and looking up the metadata, like ZFS does. And that's something that we do as well. So within our um, hardware platform, we can have a multi-tiered file system where the metadata gets stored in Flash and the rest of the storage gets stored on Nearline SAS. And the I.O. profile, it's, it's, um, it's, quite, um, it's quite amazing. There's an there's a I.O. mark, a VDIO mark, uh, VDIO mark .com, I think it is, or .org. And they did a test of the Attaching NAS platform for VDI, and they, the first and only one I've seen that people have taken it and gone and done a test outside of our control. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not a, a, a vendor paper, but you should have a look at that. That's an interesting, um, interesting white paper, at least. So is this an answer to the IO Blender? Well, we think so. We can access anything in a 60 terabyte volume that we can present at the VSP. We can access any bit any byte, any block, any access, any 8K um, sub, sub object within a VMFS data store within a millisecond and do 800,000 IOs in that time frame. So we're talking about a technology where you can access anything in that data center without the IO penalty you're going to get. So this is, these are cache miss as well. This is, this, is thing that, this is not staged in cache. This is not volumes in cache. This is volumes that are exclusively on the hard drives. In a VMware workload, but you've got random workloads, that's what you need to address. That's the elephant in the room from an I.O. perspective. It's not about the cache. It's not about cache coherency is interesting. And it's certainly important. But it's about what if it's not in cache? Because if it's random, it's not going to be in cache. So this funnel aspect is everything flows downhill. From a VMFS perspective, obviously VMFS 5, clustered file system as it is, all those IOs are going to be from multiple different ESX infrastructures and multiple clouds within VSS, uh, VMFS infrastructures. So you can have multiple work streams that are combating each other. You need to have a technology platform that can isolate one vCloud from another vCloud from another vCloud, not from within vCenter, but from outside vCenter or inside vCenter. That's the difference from a vCloud, the vCloud suite perspective, is that we can accommodate both of those architectures with one technology platform. That's the big difference between an enterprise um, technology platform which has resource control, high availability, and scalability, is that we can do both of those things to accommodate the business model and the technology model at the same time. So it's very important to understand the, the, the technology um, that you're applying. From our perspective, it's important to understand um, what technology you have 
problems you have because those problems change with each different version. So we know that the vols are going to change the way that um, the storage infrastructure is requirements. We know that uh, from a technology platform, we know that the things are not stopping. The CPUs are getting bigger, the memories are getting bigger, server sizes and quantities, are, um, we're selling less of them. So we know that they're only going to get bigger. From our perspective, to maximize the assets, we need to em em embrace the concepts of cost per IOP. We need to embrace the concepts of usable capacity per IOP. And that's a metric which is not really well known about, but we need to understand that with this flash technology, it's about 466% less than SAS technology from an IO density perspective. So usable cost per IOP, I can do 466% less infrastructure and flow space, power cooling, it's five times less power cooling as well. So the use case for this technology, we see it with them ERP applications, OLTP, uh, critical data, and financial data, things you need instant access to. So large volumes, instant access, less than a millisecond response time. And you'll see at the end, I have actually, um, I've got a couple of examples of customers who've taken the response time to thousands of, is it hundreds of, of milliseconds. So they're down below 0 0.0 from response time of a random I.O. perspective. That's the application of this technology. That's real world. Uh, and I'll show you that at the end. So from the elements of the architecture and the VMware environment, we need to make sure that the arrays are VAAI enabled, that we support all the APIs natively, Third-party storage inherits those capabilities, all of the primitive capabilities, the ones that work. And we need to support the largest volumes possible so we can enable people to have larger data stores. Obviously, there's some physical limitations on LUNs as well. So if you want to talk about those as well, I'm more than happy to come and, come and have a chat with me about those. And there's a sweet spot as well. So even taking things to the limit doesn't incur penalties. And um, those are physical penalties. We still kind of get away from the fact all these things are happening in SCSI, right? There's a, another elephant in the room. There's a lot of elephants. And so from an integration perspective, we need to make sure we have um, a distributed I.O. capability at the back end. And we need to have, make sure we have the right file system on top of that, on that, on that, um, that tier. We need to make sure we adopt all the VWI primitives that are appropriate for our technology. And, and within our, from our perspective, we need to make sure the tyranny of distance in your IT is reduced. So that's what that big switch in the middle does. The big switch in the middle makes sure that everything can access everything. When you have that, you have 192 gigabytes of bandwidth, not gigabits, it's a two terabit switch in the middle, connects everything up together, non-blocking architecture, making sure that everything can talk to everything. And on top of that, you need to have the right technology platform, the, the right operating system. You need to have the automation layer in there from storage DRS. You need to have the right management platform, you know, the Tachi storage manager, whatever your network management products are, to have one pane of glass. And that's pane with an E, not an I. So when you get to these converged infrastructures that uh, Atachi's come into the market with, and um, we look at the sewing up all of these different pieces together to create a coherent technology platform. So from when we start putting these things together, we, we came to market with a, with a unique approach. We knew we've got really good servers, we knew we had really good storage, and somebody decided to put them together. We came to the market um, with UCP Pro and UCP Select. UCP Pro is effectively has an automation layer. So vCenter 5, you go to vCenter 5. From vCenter 5, one click can provision any of your storage network um, or your servers. We see physical infrastructure, we see virtual infrastructure, one pane of glass. It looks very nice, demos really well. Um, but it's not really the point. The point of the architecture was about having reference solutions. So that's why we looked at making sure people have the right tools to do the right job. Making sure you have, you can choose what network you want to use. You can choose what storage you want to use. You can choose whatever, you know, whatever CPU you want to use. But you have building blocks. And you can go to people with a design paradigm that's been certified, validated, pre-validated by the vendors and so your deployment time should be less. Doesn't necessarily mean the integration's gonna be less, but the, the, the promise that is provided by the UCP Select is that you can choose whatever you want and bring it to your party. So we've got, um, obviously, Hitachi Storage, and um, the choice of Hitachi servers or Cisco servers from a reference perspective, 
all pre-validated, all um, all the all the technology has been been uh, been tested together. We had a number of uh, of releases of this uh, this uh, these white papers. You can look at all these; they're all available on the on the interweb. If you want to download them and, and spend half your life reading 50 pages of of uh, detailed documentation, you can. And um, I'd probably recommend looking at the overviews, seeing which ones are applicable, and seeing which ones align with your business requirements, and then push them into um, push them into your technology um, solution, your architecture groups, and get them to make sure they consider these technologies because they point out limitations of the of the implementations today and some of the reference architectures that other people provide. So a lot of those are around applications and um, targeting specific applications. Um, but the idea is we're having a common operating environment as well, so it's the same server, same storage, same, um, same network across, uh, across those platforms. So what does it look like in a box diagram? Well, it kind of looks like this. Um, we have Apache servers. We have you know, the choice of using Cisco servers and this future integration with third-party servers. We test everything. We do about 1.2 million um, interoperability tests a year out of our labs in, Nepal, in uh, Santa Clara. We make sure that everything t works together. So when you go to buy a, an Hitachi thing and you log a call, the sales process from our perspective, from my perspective, my job is to make sure that everything you've put into your infrastructure has been tested. Operating systems, network, storage, hypervisor. So that whenever you log a call, it's only something new we know we find out about. So, and we can work with the other vendors as well, make sure that they are. We're, we're an elite, elite partner with, with VMware. And as we are with a lot of other vendors, and and that integration really is a lot of um, takes a lot of the, the pain away. Whenever you have problems, you have the right people to to look at the problems across the entire technology stack. So yeah, Cisco is one of those partners. We, we've got 10 years of integration with Cisco, and we've been reselling Cisco technology, and we're a partner of Cisco, and from a network perspective. We're very, very strongly aligned, both te technical companies and um, background. Basically, the vision from Hitachi and the vision from Cisco and even from VMware are very similar. You know, it's about scalability, it's about availability, it's about using the right technology where you need to. Um, so when you get the right technology, you need to have a plan. And that's exactly what the CVDs um, bring to the Cisco validated architecture, that ability to deploy and integrate and um, get your infrastructure up as running as quickly as possible without cutting the corners too much. And ultimately, it all leads downhill. Availability, yep, we both got that. Performance, yep, we both have that. And reliability, I think um, we're the only technology platform will give you that 100% guarantee, as I said before, and, and that's because we trust the technology. So I'll just dig into what this looks like. From a UCP perspective, obviously from a reference architecture, we expect um, FCUE traffic um, from the servers into the, uh, the, inter the fabric interconnect. We can port channel them into our, into our uh, Nexus 5000, and then from there we can FC connect into our VSP storage array. And the reference architecture makes sure that we can scale as well, so that the, the bottleneck isn't a case of a plant deploying multiple storage arrays behind the scenes. We can have one storage platform for all the data there, and they, and they leverage the benefit of the of the, the half technology before. So, it's a combination of the right server technology, the right network technology, and the right um, storage technology. And if you want to go fi um, fabric, fiber channel, you know, I've seen that um, Amy Lakes released a 16 gig, um, and that's the, the problem. The problem is the when you look at the the performance that the storage arrays are able to provide, you really have to push the paths up to over you know 32 paths to the storage array before you get the I.O. out of the server infrastructure that pushes the storage infrastructure. So we've got, um, if you push the, the storage infrastructure, it's capable of a million IOPS, the hosts need to be pushing those million IOPS as well. So you need more HBAs basically and faster HBAs to get to that next level from performance perspective. So that's one of the things that's, that, that's missing in the, in the conversations at the moment. The limitations are not in the storage array anymore. The limitations are not in the servers anymore. The limitations are kind of in the middle. So we've got to work out a way to scale out that capability and reduce that tyranny of distance between the storage infrastructure and the applications that are sitting on our computer infrastructure. 
So some of the use cases, obviously, from a, a lot of people talk about HA and availability. Um, from a type perspective, we have a certified um, cluster, um, metro cluster as well. So VMware vSphere 5 uh, metro cluster with the Apache VSP. Um, again, the right technology platform. We can do our snapshotting. We can do all of those other BCP capabilities. And I have Mike before talking about islands of um, technology and how does he manage those in different data centers? Do they share the same disks? You need the right technology. That's not an issue for us because we can put things into consistency groups. We can put things into protection groups. We can put things into protection groups inside the storage infrastructure that relate back to the um, relate back to the infrastructure and the business requirements. So we can map these things on. We don't have to have a bespoke platform for each of the tiers of storage. We can do that logically within the within the technology. And whenever new technology comes along, we can repurpose that technology. So we can move tier three to tier one whenever a new tier one becomes available. We can use tier zero to tier you know, point zero, whatever, whenever the new technology comes along. So it's about planning for the future. We think of seven to nine years from a storage perspective. Seven to nine years. Now think about that in a technology perspective or in a car, you're going to buy your car, you know, in nine years' time you'll be driving the same car. You might be because you love it, but you won't be because it's faster, more efficient, more scalable, gets you need to be quicker. You want to get the latest technology because that's where you can get your market advantage by putting the right technology in the right place at the right time. So just summarize some of the use cases for the, the VSP with the flash technology. Um, we obviously have a multi-tenancy in the actual hardware as well, so we can, uh, that can accommodate the, the vCenter and, and, and vCloud director, the vCloud suite, and its alignment. From VDI perspective, we can accommodate VDI, vCloud, and VSX infrastructure, and we do it today, um, in ISPs um, around the world, to have that technology platform stood up side by side on the same spinning disks, but logically partitioned with the right resource control. So things to consider moving forward, and um, obviously it's actually accelerated flash, and um, it's available today. We can show you the, I'll show you the numbers in a second, and um, what it looks like. Keep things native, use the VMware tools. S, uh, you know, VWI is really important going forward as you push the density up. VVOLs have become more important um, as you push the density up. Needs more complexity. Needs more integration. Needs more things to go wrong. So keep it as simple as possible, and push it down to the hardware whenever you can, because the hardware can manage um, things in silicon, whereas the software has to negotiate to use things in silicon. So, interestingly, there's an eight times footprint reduction when you start using this flash technology. It's not about reducing the I/O. 128 of these flash drives will replace 32. Oh, sorry, other way around. 128 400 gig MLC drives will be replaced from a performance perspective and a capacity perspective by 32 of these, the, the half, 1.6 terabyte half drives. Okay? Not fiction, fact. We've got the, we've got the white papers, if you believe the our white papers. You can talk to the people and the customers who use the technology to see how they get the benefit out of it. There's references up there I don't expect people to read, but those on the WebEx can, um, can, will be able to see those. Um, the references around the, the, the architectures, around VDI, um, so View, even, um, there's even a Citrix Zen desktop on top of uh, vSphere as well, um, as well as the, the three major technology platforms, the VSP, the Hus VM, and the Hus 150. Um, those are reference architectures you can, you can dissect till your heart's content. Um, and with that, Anybody got any questions around other technology or otherwise um, around Hitachi technology? If you have any questions, you can come and see me at the booth. We'll be standing by the booth. Um, so thanks for that. I'll quickly show you some, um, some real numbers. These are all cache mess numbers. This is, this is what this technology is capable of. In, this is a lab, so it's, it is in a lab, but it's, this, is not, this is no architecture. There's no architecture. The VSP's cache is not helping here. These are I.O. that they had to go back to disk for. So that's a million IOPS and it's a three millisecond response time. That's one million IOPS on a, as large a VMFS volume as you want in, in a three milliseconds. If you want to just step it down a bit, dial it down to you know, 800,000 IOPS, we can get that to any VMFS point of the VMFS volume 
in less than a millisecond. So the requirement to put servers and, and flash on the, on the servers, you can do that. But you don't need to do that for every single use case. So you can reduce the cost of your server infrastructure by having the right technology in the right place. There is a bit of a discrepancy between reads and writes with SSD technology. Writes are a little bit slower. But still, there's 260,000 writes in less than a millisecond. And in a real world example, and how we see in the real world, we see VMware vSphere 5 and on SaaS technologies, we're seeing average response time in a heavily used environment around about 5.4 milliseconds. The Oracle workload, which is a random workload, was around 3 milliseconds. And with the flash license, that's just the software. So this is the controller logic, having an express path host IO, reducing to 0.3 milliseconds response time from an, a complex Oracle workload. And the database is around, I think it's around 40 or 50 gig in size, the primary volume. And but this is the, the response time we're getting from there. vSphere 5, with just the license applied, we're getting a reduction of 50% from the, from the I.O. perspective. But once we use the HAF technology, which was cheaper than the MLC technology from the customer's perspective, you can see the dramatic reduction there. We're talking about thousands of milliseconds here. And that's the interesting part is that we've got tens of milliseconds um, response times. And these are real world customers. These are not, this isn't just pretend. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll, um, I'll wrap it up. Thanks for your time. And I'll be at the booth.